Hi guys, Matt Easton here. This is a shout out to one of my viewers called Matthew who uh, requested that I make a video about um, the flexibility of sword blades. Um, <clears throat> this uh, seems like a simple topic but actually it's quite a complicated one and I could talk for probably an hour about it but uh, you'll be happy to know that I'm not going to do that. I'm going to talk for about five minutes hopefully. Um, now, um, flexibility of sword blades, you will hopefully all be aware that um, carbon steel and indeed stainless steel um, when it's hardened and tempered becomes flexible like a spring um, and a, a, a good sword blade often, though not always, is, um, is hardened and tempered in such a way that it leaves a flexible spring blade remaining. However, first thing to say is not all swords are made like that. So in uh, Europe and um, uh, parts of China and most of Asia, uh, in fact, uh, mono steel was used for sword blades, certainly in the last few centuries. Um, and the mono steel was hardened, that is quenched, and then tempered, that is taken to the uh, kind of blue colour and then allowed to cool slowly. Um, and that results in essentially a leaf spring, uh, a, a sprung steel blade. And really the reason for doing this is what you're doing is you're making the blade hard at the edge, whilst at the same time making it, instead of uh, a sort of brittle like glass, um, and leaving it very, very hard but very brittle, obviously that would break in use, you're then introducing flexibility and springiness to the blade, really so that it can survive the rigours of combat, both hitting and stabbing into uh, opponents and shields and armour and such like, um, but also uh, in defence, of course, absorbing blows and parrying and deflecting other uh, blades and other weapons and so on and so forth. Um, now, uh, not all swords are made like that. Uh, a famous example being the katana, the Japanese sword. Uh, that is, in, in fact, only hardened at the edge. Okay, and it is not it is not hardened and tempered in the way that European swords are, for example, or indeed most African and most other Asian swords. It is um, simply only quenched at the edge. The back of the blade is soft. So if you take a traditionally made Japanese katana and put your foot on it and step down on it, you will bend it and it will stay bent because the majority of the blade is essentially soft steel. It's unheat treated steel. Only the edge is really heat treated and some of the surface, okay? But the core of it is not really heat treated. So it, it will bend and stay bent, much like a Bronze Age sword. Bronze Age swords, incidentally, they'll flex a little bit, uh, but once you bend bronze, it generally stays bent. Now, it's not only Japanese swords that that applies to. Some, uh, <coughs> some Indian swords were made on a similar basis, and I've had um, Afghan and Indian weapons that I have uh, <laughs> gingerly straightened by hand, and they've proven to be relatively soft, actually. Now, whilst the edge was hard, and therefore I imagine they were in some way edge-quenched, um, the or even perhaps hammer hardened, I don't really know, it's a bit of a mystery and lots of aspects of Asian uh, sword making are now lost and forgotten unfortunately. Um, but some Indian swords are not spring tempered in the way that most European swords are. Um, now, why do you make, uh, I've mentioned why do you make a, a sword blade as a spring, it's essentially for resilience. I've also shown there are uh, famous and successful types of sword, like some types of tulwa and some types of uh, Japanese sword, um, and e indeed some types of Chinese and, and, and other nationality swords, that are not spring-tempered. There's a balance there, because if you have a steel that uh, it doesn't necessarily deal particularly well with spring tempering, or indeed if you have another way of making the edge hard without making the blade into a spring, such as the Japanese katana where you have very hard steel at the edge and softer steel in the core and at the back, um, then you don't necessarily need to make it into a spring. So there are different ways essentially of giving a weapon a hard edge and a resilient body. Okay, So not every blade needs to be a spring. Um, <coughs> The next thing I would say is that um, flexibility in a blade is only a virtue in terms of resilience. Okay? Generally speaking, having a very wobbly blade, imagine it was you know, some of those Chinese swords, for example, you see in Kung Fu films that can, you can kind of wibble around. There is no advantage, <laughs> except for some very bizarre whipping techniques, there is no advantage to having a blade that is wobbly. Okay? Um, for two reasons. One, I'll just pick up a sword here, uh, there we go. One, because when you thrust into something resistive, 
the blade will flex in answer to the force in this direction and you will lose penetrative power if your blade is very flexible. Okay? Equally in the cut, all blades of this kind, if you hit the pommel there, you'll notice that the blade wibbles okay? and you therefore get lateral vibrations when you hit other objects. There is a degree of uh, sideways vibration. Uh, now, in a well-made sword this shouldn't necessarily matter and equally if you make the cut well in the right region of the blade with the edge and such like. However, if you fluff the cut slightly or it's not a very well-made sword or it's a very resistive target, some of these sideways vibrations might, and don't always, but they might interfere with your cutting power. Okay, So the thing to, uh, the thing to emphasize is that a good cutting and thrusting sword is stiff. Okay, you generally want your blade to be as stiff as possible. Now that doesn't mean that the steel needs to be brittle or hard um, to make it stiff. In actual fact what you want is a blade that is shaped in a way to make it as stiff as possible whilst the steel, if it needs to, can flex in order that the blade doesn't break. Okay? So the blade only is flexible to prevent it from breaking. But you don't ideally want the blade to flex because by remaining stiff you impart the greatest force upon the target, particularly with thrusts but also with cuts. And final thing I would say is that of course different types of blade come in different stiffnesses. This is an example of basically probably the stiffest sword I own, even stiffer than any of the long swords. And you basically cannot flex this because it's a triangular section blade. And that is really, it's not a question of the material, it's a question of the cross-section. There are certain types of cross-section of blade where you trade off things against each other. What this has done is it's traded all its cutting ability, it has no edge at all and could never cut anybody, for utter, utter specialisation of the thrust. And some long swords, uh, in the period where people were trying to overcome armour, uh, half sorting into gaps between uh, plates of armour to thrust through mail and padded um, protection underneath the, the plate. Um, they sacrificed cutting capacity often to increase thrusting capacity or make it better for half sorting and using as a lever in that way. So different types of cross section of blade may sacrifice certain qualities in order to accentuate other qualities. Um, and therefore they may sometimes be, uh, they may be stiffer as a, as, a, um, as a byproduct of their cross section which is specialised for a certain purpose. Okay, so there's a brief overview of uh, flexibility and stiffness of sword blades. And uh, the final thing I would mention as well is um, the, the ability to make a steel blade that is very flexible like a spring, whilst you don't want the blade to be wibbly and floppy because it won't cut well and it won't thrust well, to be able to make a blade that can flex a long way and in extreme examples be curled in a full circle, which would take a huge amount of force to do incidentally, you'd probably need some kind of contraption and various people pulling on the end of it to get most sword blades to describe a full circle. But if a blade could be forced into a full circle, that shows that the integrity of the steel is very good. And you have to remember that in pre-industrial times, when steel was uh, created through uh, kind of you know pre-industrial processes, it often had uh, inclusions, slag and, and, and other um, elements in, in the steel that you didn't really want there, maybe a bit more phosphorus or a bit more sulphur than you wanted or a bit more magnesium than you wanted. And this could create weak points in the blade. And a blade that could be flexed a long way, whilst you don't want the blade to flex in combat, ideally, if it can be flexed under a lot of force and not break, that is a uh, sign of good steel because it shows that the steel is homogeneous and doesn't have weak points in it. But you mustn't confuse those two points. You want your blade to be able to flex under extreme force to show that it's good quality, if it's that type of sword blade, not a katana incidentally, but you don't want the blade to flex under small amount of force because then whenever you thrust someone or cut someone you're going to be losing a lot of the energy to either vibrations in a cut or bending in a thrust. I hope that's somewhat clear and that is a summary of what's a much more complicated and big topic. Cheers!